Good morning. Good morning. Happy Easter. He is risen. All right. Why don't you guys stand with us? This is your first time here. Welcome to Cambria Vineyard Church. I'm going to just open with some prayer and then we can begin to worship. Father, we just thank you for today. We just thank you for everything that you do for us, God. Father, I ask that you would just be with us. Give us a fresh touch of you this morning. We thank you for the sunshine. We thank you for family. We thank you for being able to worship here as one. Father, just touch our hearts today. And we give you our praise in Jesus' name. claimed its victory the king of love had given up his life the darkest day in history there on the cross they made for sinners for every curse his blood atoned final breath and it was finished but not the end we could have known for the earth began to shake and the veil was torn but sacrifice was made as the heavens roll, all hail King Jesus, all hail the Lord of heaven and earth, all hail King Jesus, all hail the Savior of the world. There was a moment when the sky lit up, a flash of lightning breaking through. When all was lost, when all was lost, he crossed eternity. The king of life, the king of life was on the roof. For in a dark and cold tomb, where our Lord was laid, one miraculous breath. And we're forever changed. All hail King Jesus. All hail the Lord of heaven and earth. All hail King Jesus. All hail the Savior of the world. 
stars they wet, the morning sun was there, the Savior of the world was falling. His body on the cross, His blood poured out for us, the weight of every curse upon Him.
sing hallelujah. We sing hallelujah. The Lamb is overcome. We sing hallelujah. We sing hallelujah. We sing hallelujah. For the Lamb is overcome. We sing hallelujah. We sing hallelujah. We sing hallelujah. For the Lamb is overcome. We sing hallelujah. We sing hallelujah. We sing hallelujah. to this what a beautiful name it is the name of Jesus Greater, and what 
you can may remain standing if you want. <laughs> anyway, I want to give greetings to our online family, and we got a packed out tent over there, and we, I, we see you, I see you, and uh, anyway, glad that you've joined us, and thanks for being with us uh, in our tent. We have a brand new giant screen TV 
uh, out there. So it's uh, it's uh, it's pretty cool over there. I've been visiting over there while we've been worshiping. You know what's beautiful among other things today is all the kids that are here. One of the things this church has been dreaming and asking God for is for that younger generation and for kids. And we have a number of kids here and outside playing and, and in the tent. And it's just a beautiful thing to have the kids because they bring so much life, don't they? They bring so much life to everybody and everything. And, and so it's just what a perfect Easter to have so many of, uh, of our kids around. You know, one of the traditional things that, uh, that the church typically does, and, you know, it, it is a beautiful name, the name of Jesus. But it's that name that we declare that he is risen. And in many churches, when somebody says he is risen, the congregation says, He is risen indeed. You have been around. <laughs> he is risen. He is risen indeed. He is risen. He is risen indeed. We can't hear you out there in the tent. He is risen. He is risen indeed. One more time. He is risen. He is risen indeed. I think you believe that. <laughs> All right, Jesse's going to come. And he's going to lead us into a time of, of communion, a special time celebrating Easter. He is risen. He is risen. <laughs> <laughs> so I had to get one in. <laughs> I was hoping they wouldn't do it for you. <laughs> If uh, we're going to take communion right now, if you're looking for it, it's in your in front of you in the seat pocket. Um, and if you don't have a chair in front of you, then you might have sat on it. <laughs> As they ate, Jesus took the bread and blessed it and broke it and gave it to his disciples. He said to them, this is my body. Eat it. So let us take and eat the bread. Then taking the cup of wine, he gave thanks to the Father. He entered into covenant with them, saying, This is my blood. Each of you must drink it in fulfillment of the covenant. For this is the blood that seals the new covenant. It will be poured out for many for the complete forgiveness of sins. The next time we drink this, I will be with you. And we will drink it together with a new understanding in the kingdom realm of the Father. So let us take and drink the cup. So, Father, we just thank you for the cross. We thank you for your blood. We thank you for a new covenant and a new understanding of who you are and what you did for us. We can never say thank you enough, God. But we will continue to. So thank you, Jesus. Thank you for your blood. And we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. No, 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 not yet, not yet. <laughs> the kids are going to go, but you're, we're not going to let you get out of here just, um, just yet. By the way, this week uh, we had a Good Friday service at First Baptist, and I got to meet the other pastors, and what a special time, and so many of our Cambria Vineyard friends uh, were there I just want you to know, in this season that Becky and I have been here, to be the lead pastors here in the Camry Vineyard has been really special to us. And I want you to know it's been a, one of the biggest privileges of my life to be with you during this season uh, for the church and also the season for, for Becky and I. And it's been a rich time for, for me as well and for Becky and I and our, us together. And, and uh, it's just, I'm going to always cherish our time together. So it's my first Easter uh, here with you. And uh, I'm glad to celebrate it with you here today. And uh, we've got lots of kids here today, but before we release them, we want to just pray a blessing on them. So if there's a, 
a child next to you, near you, somebody younger than you. <laughs> just, we want to just bless the kids. Jesus, uh, Lord, there's life in the room because those of us that have walked with you for a while, Lord, uh, we rejoice in that. But Lord, these young kids here, they represent not the next generation, but the now generation. We pray that today, Lord, as they, they experience you and come together, that, that you would just be with them, that you would tell them how much you love them and how you see them and you're for them, God. And they would just find that today is not only a safe place, but a place of life to them, God. And so as you told us to, Lord, we bless the kids. We bless the kids and all that you put in them and all that you have for them. In Jesus' name, and everyone said, amen. amen. Or wow. uh, we have a new, and everyone said, wow. wow. Okay. So now you can go. Okay. Yay. What do you mean, yay? <laughs> it's like, I know you're going to miss me. I know that. I just feel that somehow. That <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so we also uh, want to take our Easter offering. So uh, if our ushers would come up, yeah, we're going to just receive our, our offering. Again, this is for those of you that are part of the Game Cambria Vineyard family. And uh, no pressure to give whatsoever. But uh, thank you for those of you that give and uh, allow the church to be what, what this church is about and do the work that we're trying to do in our city. Father, receive our offering, God, as an act of love and gratefulness, Lord, and thankfulness that we are for all the things that we have. Lord, and we extend this as part of our worship, that we honor you, acknowledge you. And so we give to you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Today I want to talk to you about hope, that hope has risen. Take a look at this and we'll begin. has risen indeed when Jesus was raised from the dead on that first Easter morning and he was alive and that is the cornerstone of our faith and what we celebrate today but along with that that hope has risen that things can be better that things can be more Jesus came into a world in despair they had given up on God they had given up on life they had given up on their future that the hope had been sucked right out of them. And so when Jesus died on the cross, even the disciples who had followed him, it was like the end of the, of the road for them. It's like, how, how could this be? That we thought he was the one. We thought he was our, our Messiah, that he was the Christ, that he was going to change the world. And then he's on a cross. How did that happen? You know, in our own lives, there are times where we, we don't know how we're going to get through what we're going through. You ever been there? Maybe you're in a 
a hard spot, a crossroads in your own life, and you say, I don't, I don't know what to do. I don't know how I'm going to make it. It can be financially. It can be emotional. It can be whatever. It's like you don't see a way forward. The disciples were in that place. They couldn't see a way forward after this. They were completely done. But Jesus wasn't done because when Jesus was raised from the dead, to give us new life, to forgive us of our sins, but also to give us a future. But I love that phrase that hope has risen. And for some of you, I wonder, and I hope as we celebrate Easter today, that hope rises up in you. Maybe you're you're stuck in your own life. Maybe in relationships or marriage or with kids or with whatever it is, and you feel stuck. But the hope of the resurrection, the hope that we celebrate today is beyond what I can see, God is faithful and able to bring me through whatever it is that I'm going through. So Sean is going to come, and we're going to revisit the story. And Sean's going to share some words from Matthew. He might end up preaching, so we've got to be careful here. So, <laughs> Early on Sunday morning, as the new day was dawning, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went out to visit the tomb. Suddenly, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven, rolled aside the stone, and sat on it. His face shone like lightning, and his clothing was as white as as snow. The guards shook with fear when they saw him, and they fell into a dead faint. Then the angel spoke to the women. Don't be afraid, he said. I know you are looking for Jesus, who was crucified. He isn't here. He is risen from the dead, just as he said would happen. Come, see where his body was lying, and now go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead and he is going ahead of you to Galilee. You'll see him there. Remember what I have told you. The women ran quickly from the tomb. They were very frightened, but also filled with great joy. And they rushed to give the disciples the angel's message. And as they went, Jesus met them and greeted them. And they ran to him, grasped his feet, and worshiped him. Then Jesus said to them, don't be afraid. Go tell my brothers to leave for Galilee, and they will see me there. Thank you. The word of the Lord. I think Sean's preaching next Sunday, so you might want to come out. (laughs) We haven't told him that yet. Thank you, Sean. Paul summarizes this very event in 1 Corinthians 15 when he said these words. He said, I passed on to you what was most important and what had also been passed on to me, that Christ died for our sins, just as the scripture said. He was buried and he was raised from the dead on the third day, just as the scripture said. He was seen by Peter and then by the 12. After that, he was seen by more than 500 of his followers at one time most of whom are still alive, though some have died. You know, when I, when I read that for the first time, and I didn't catch it at first, 500 people saw Jesus alive. It wasn't just like a, a wishing type of hope. I wish he didn't, if, you know, that he didn't have to die. I, I wish he was alive, that 500 people saw him alive. He was seen by Peter and by the 12 and by others that they saw Jesus alive from the dead. These were the same group that were in despair and hopeless. They had lost all hope. What are we going to do now? I thought we thought he was the Messiah. And then he dies in the most tragic way uh, on a cross. See, the disciples, like people in those days, they were all, the whole culture, the Jewish culture of that day, they were in despair, hoping for a deliverer and hoping for Messiah and None of that was happening. They'd given up. You ever given up? They'd given up on, on anything more. But then Jesus comes and say, maybe, maybe he's the one that's going to turn this around. They were, 
they were preconditioned. They had an, added, an idea of what the Messiah would be. And that's one of our issues when we have a preconceived about who God is and what he's going to do and not do. And then we feel let down when it doesn't work out the way that it would happen. One of the things, the games that I play that is not a good game, and it's the game if I were God. You ever played that game? It's a losing game. You will lose every time. If I were God, I would do this. If I were God, I wouldn't do this. I wouldn't do that, but I would do this. I would do this if I were God. And then, you know, somewhere along the line, somebody <laughs> taps you on the shoulder. The good news for everybody else is you're not God. <laughs> They're preconditioned that the Messiah would drive out the Romans and set up his kingdom and people lined the streets of Jerusalem with, you know, with palm leaves, you know, welcoming Hosanna, Hosanna, you know, in the highest. And they're, they're celebrating him. They wanted to, they wanted to crown him king. And then uh, they're ready to do that. But he was not to be king, at least not yet. We sing, you know, G King Jesus, and he is our ruling and reigning king. But that was later. It wasn't right then. Instead, he was heading to a cross. How, how could the Savior, the Messiah, die on a cross? And last week, we talked about that. The reason Jesus died, I needed him to die. That he bore my sin, he, he bore my shame. He, he did for me what I couldn't do for myself. But today, we celebrate what comes after that. But disillusion and despair was the order of the day. You know, the disciples weren't even at the cross. That really bums me out. Now, it kind of ticks me off. You know, it's one thing to, you know, say, I don't, uh, you know, I can't handle this and that. But it was only John and Mary, the mother of Jesus, that, is, that we, we know for sure was even at the cross. Everybody else is, we're out of here. We can't see it. We can't bear it. It's too, it's too hard. And they ran away, and Jesus was not only suffering, but he suffered mostly alone because those that he had poured his life into had abandoned him in the biggest hour of need. Certainly, there was no resurrection on the radar because they didn't, wouldn't, they refused to believe he would die. Jesus warned them, for this I've come into the world to give my life away. And said, so we, won't, we, won't, we won't have it. But hope was on the way, was on the horizon, and they didn't know it. You know, before you came to Christ, you were probably in the same place. And surprise, surprise, when you meet Jesus, you meet a future. All of a sudden, there's new opportunity, there's new life, there's new dreams, and it comes alive. I was somebody that I was so lost and dead and empty. I didn't grow up as a Christian, didn't go to church and all that. And the idea was God was an empty thought for me. But life was an empty thought for me. And I had no idea what was out there until I met Jesus. And all of a sudden, I had hope for Rick that maybe there's more for me. Maybe there's a purpose for my life. Maybe there's a plan for my life. Maybe there's something more in my life that I couldn't get to, and I've experienced that. I came across a, a poem of hope, because the theme of today is hope has risen. The latter part of this poem that I'll read to you is hope is found. You can follow on the screen if you'd like or listen. Hope is found today when we celebrate a stone that was rolled away to reveal freedom. We are no longer held in bondage. We are free, freed from the chains that held us captive and aimed to kill. But our Savior came and took them to the hill to hang them there to show the goodness of the one who made us. Hope is found at a tomb that was borrowed so we can know that our lives were bought at a price, at a noble sacrifice of love to bring hope, I love this, to the hopeless Life to the lifeless, breath to the breathless, a restored creation reconciled to their creator to join together for good. Hope is found because the linens were left to show that we will not be left alone. Hope is found in the resurrection 
to know that we are received by our creator as his very good creation because death had no grip on his son. The one who saw us and came to give. Hope that this life is not the end. I'm going to say that one again. Hope that this life is not the end because his resurrection was the beginning. Hope is found today in the eternal reward with our creator who thought of us on this day because we could not repay our debt. Hope is what we celebrate now because hope was found on Easter day. Hope lives because he lives. If he wasn't raised from the dead, then hope wouldn't live. It wouldn't have life. It would just be wishful thinking. I hope that things can get better. Life sucks. Life's bad. Everything's wrong. Everything's dark. But because he lives, I live. Because whatever obstacles I can face, because Jesus' resurrection, he overcame death, the ultimate obstacle And if the obstacle of death can be overcome, then every issue of your life and my life is overcome as well. Have you ever heard the term, hope springs eternal? It's actually not a Bible verse. Some people would think it is. But it comes from an 18th century poet, Alexander Pope. He wasn't the first pope, by the way. (laughs) Hope springs eternal. For us, yes. For us that know Christ, for us that have that living hope, it does bring etern- eternal. It's like, I don't know how it's going to work out. I don't know how it's going to get better. I, this is the end. I don't see a way forward. But I know that there is. I'm not just hoping there is. I know there will be, and my hope is in him yeah. to bring me that future, to get me through this, to get me out of the hole, to get me out of the mess. And my trust and my hope is in him. And one of the issues that people have today, they're trying to dig themselves out of the very hole that they've dug for themselves. And then it ends up becoming like a grave. And then you finally come to that place when you call out to God for mercy, for rescue, and that's what he majors in. He loves to rescue people that have dug a hole so deep they can't get out. A mess that they can't see beyond. Then he comes in the midst of that and he offers himself. His self as the answer is the way through it. Biblical hope. Trying to unpack it here. Here's an idea. Biblical hope for us that follow Jesus is a confident expectation that God is willing and able to fulfill the promise he has made to those who trust him. One more time. A confident expectation. I don't know how, but I know that God is willing. But that's not enough to know that God's willing if he's not able. It doesn't help to know God's able if he's not willing. They got to go together. An expectation, God, you're willing and you're able to fulfill the promises he has made to those who trust him. That's why the scriptures are so important. Because in the scriptures, we read about the promises of God for our life. And without that, we wouldn't know. I will never leave you or forsake you is one, for instance. I've come that you may have life and have it to the full. That's a promise. It's not like empty promises that we used to make and and, and have been made to us. Hope is the unswerving belief that better days are ahead, that better days are ahead. I don't know how, but tomorrow's got to be better than today. But a lot of people give up, and they end their life. Because when hope goes, it all goes away. This is one you can take with you. I'll quote it again at the end. The hope of Easter, my friends, can not only change your life, but rewrite your future. 
I was born in, in adultery to a single mom and raised by her in a pretty horrific world around her and me. And yet God had a future for what they called bastard that nobody could see and nobody could touch and nobody could get to. But when I became 19 years old, I had an encounter with Jesus Christ and all of a sudden hope came out of nowhere. I had no sense of future, no sense of hope. And one of the things that I I'm most grateful for is God gave me a future I didn't have and couldn't get to even if I wanted one. And that is the hope of Jesus being alive. And I had an encounter when I was 19 years old cleaning the classroom at Cal State Dominguez Hills with the living God, with Jesus, in a most unusual, awkward place. Changed my life forever. And all of a sudden, hope became living in me. 1 Peter 1 tells us, Praise be to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Here it is. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope. Say living hope with me. Living. One more time. Living hope. Not a dead hope. A living hope is given through the resurrection of Jesus Christ that hope has risen as Christ was risen from the dead. But then he goes on, Peter does, and into an inheritance <clears throat> that can never perish, spoil, or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you, who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. But backing up for a second, an inheritance. You know, it's one thing to have an inheritance, but I don't know if you've ever experienced that because people do. Sometimes they have an inheritance, but by the time they get it, it's gone. Or it went to somebody else or something happened. And that inheritance that you were hoping to get, you know, anticipating to get, it didn't exist anymore. That's not the way it works with God. That we have an inheritance stored up for us. And we get, we get some of it now. By the way, for those of you that want to give an inheritance to your kids, just a thought, don't wait till you die to give something to them. It's amazing how that happens. You know, so we got a piece of our inheritance right now while we're alive, but most of it's going to be on the other side. Well, I don't know. A lot of it's going to be on this side, but I don't know what it is. But there's something stored up for Rick and for each of you and for us that's, that's coming, and it's it's. And it's, uh, it's not going to perish, spoil, or fade. It's not going to lose interest, you know. It's not going to blow up in the stock market, you know. It's, it's there for us, and we have that. And that's a hope that whatever I don't have in this life, I will have so much more in that one. Some people used to say, you're so heavenly minded, you're no earthly good. I think it's just quite the opposite. I'm going to do a talk on this about more of heaven. Because the more heavenly minded we are, I think the more earthly good we can be. Because we're not living for what we can accumulate and what we can have in this life. Even though God wants to bless you and me with so many good gifts and things from him as our heavenly father. But there's a freedom that comes as I, as I recognize that there's life beyond this. And Paul talks about that as well in 1 Corinthians 15. Familiar verse to some of you. And it's kind of a, kind of a jolt when we're talking about all these things. And if our hope, this living hope, is only for this life, Paul tells us, we are more, we are more to be pitied that anyone in the world, than anyone in the world, we're to be pitied if we only have hope in this life. I think Paul is saying, you, your hope has so much more than this life. And how sad, how tragic for you to have all of this. And you don't live like, it's, like any of it's yours, like any of it's for you. But in fact, God has been raised from the dead, and he is the first of a great harvest of all 
who died. A good friend of Becky and I, uh, Wes Stafford, he was the president of Compassion International. We love him with all of our heart. He said something I will never forget, forget, and I haven't forgotten. He said this about hope. He said, you can live without a lot of things, but the one thing you can't live without is hope. And that's when people give up, when there's no more hope, whether it's in their life, where they get addicted to stuff, where they, they abuse themselves, or whatever it is, they, they just give up. And self-hatred overtakes them, because I have no hope for me. I have no hope that God can change me, can deal with me. It's over for me. We can't live without hope, my friends, and we have a reason to have hope, a real hope, a living, a living hope. And the reality for us, there's people all around us in despair that are, that are a sense of hopelessness. When I think about the world around us right now, you can curse it and get political and do whatever you want to do, but right now people are disillusioned and feeling despair about everything. And it's not just government. You know, you think about the atrocities that are going on in our generation that you would think it would happen a thousand years ago or two thousand years ago of people being treated like they are and mutilated and all the rest of it. It's like in our day, it's happening. And people are just like, they're giving up and, they, and they're giving up on God and everybody else. But we are God's hope peddlers. I don't know if you like peddlers or that. It's like we are God's hope peddlers. And uh, when you think about that, it's like the hope that we have cannot stay to ourselves because there's hopelessness is all around us and we need to let them know there is a God who is alive for them, who has a future for them, has a plan for them, is going to be there for them and they don't have to give up on their life because in Christ we find our living hope. And his victory over death is his victory over every obstacle in our lives, but we carry that. And part of the, the reality of, of waking up and offering that hope to people that don't have any, that are lifeless and hopeless, and they don't know what to do. They don't know what to turn. They don't know what's, what, what's next. Hope lives because he lives. Because he lives. We have a hope and a future. He gave me one. And you have one too, a future to look forward to. Some of you, even in, in, in the older season of your life, what's, what's tragic for me and troubling to me is those of us that are older in my generation now, is they stop dreaming about future, living in the past, living in what was, not what is and what could be. I don't care how old you get, what condition you're in, there's still a future for you. There's still more that God has in store for you at every step of the way, every stage of life. And, and even with relationships, some of you have experienced broken relationships, but that doesn't mean God has another, a new one, a fresh one, a life-giving one. That's why you can't be living in the rejections and the hurt of the past. Because he lives, all fear is gone. I don't have to be afraid. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. I don't know what's coming, but I can face it. I don't have to run from it. Because he lives, I am forgiven. And nobody can take that away from me. In Romans, it says that there is therefore now no condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus. And the enemy, the evil one, will come and try to condemn you, shame you. Jesus says, not for me. Never going to happen. And because he lives, I have a future. Heaven is my eternal home. I think that's pretty good stuff if you ask me. What do you think? I want to close our time with a spoken word. The younger generation, hey, they put poetry in, a, in a, new, a new framework, and there's a young lady that's going to share this hope that we're talking about, this living hope. And because he lives, um, 
this young lady is going to share with us, and so I encourage you to tune in and listen to what she has to say to us. He is risen. Three small words that brought the collective pace of humanity to an absolute standstill. He is risen. Three words that shattered prisons. Words that shook the earth's foundations. Words that transformed a sense of utter despair into cries of pure joy and ecstasy. Echoes of history's greatest triumph that still shape our reality. Even today, we're assaulted by constant distraction, countless sources waging war for our attention, yet three words pierce the noise. In our hunger for validation, our desperate pleas for love and attention, three words calm our anxiety. In a universe spinning at breakneck speed, its inhabitants locked in an existential crisis, three words proclaim the purpose of our existence. He is risen. Lay hold of this truth and embrace the peace within. Yesterday, fear reigned in our hearts. Yesterday, we sat in crippling darkness. Yesterday, we suffered abuse and all the accusations of a broken world. But today, our King, our Healer, our Defender is risen. And this reality doesn't merely accompany us on a meaningless journey. This changes everything. For you see, if he is risen, then all other pursuits become secondary. All of our failures become insignificant. All criticisms and condemnations become irrelevant. There is only His Word, His mission, and His infinite, unconditional love for you. Because He is risen, we look to tomorrow. Tomorrow we will stop defining our worth through status and social media. Tomorrow we will together build an everlasting kingdom. Tomorrow and every day after, we will dance in the radiance of a redeeming Savior who crushed death and set us free. There is nothing that Jesus cannot overcome. We know this because He lives. We know this because He is risen. And God offers you and me a hope so powerful it can transform your life and rewrite your future. I want to say that again. God offers you a hope so powerful that it can transform your life and rewrite your future. And that life is in Christ. Scripture said, if anyone is in Christ, they are new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. New beginnings, new opportunities. But they're in Christ, not religion, not church, but in Christ. And the step for, for each of us is to put our life in him, receiving him. And it begins maybe with a simple prayer for some of you. If you just close your eyes right now and just, I don't know where you're at with God. Maybe you believe or don't believe or whatever's been going on and it doesn't matter. Just here you are right now. Jesus is offering you a life, his life, in exchange for us. A new beginning. He's offering you a new beginning today. A new life today, right now in him and it starts by humbling yourself with a prayer that might go like this God you can pray this if you want or your own God I need you 
I can't do this. It can't change me. It can't fix me. I can't do this. Jesus, have mercy upon me, a sinner. Jesus, I accept what you did on the cross. For the forgiveness of my sins. And I surrender. my life to you all of it today I surrender my life and give it to you whatever it is I am God it's you now thank you for loving me for reaching out to me for forgiving me in Jesus name amen that's a prayer of beginnings, of new beginnings. But a life with Jesus, now walk with him, the living hope that he has given us. I'll repeat the words, praise be to God. In fact, maybe we could put this on the screen again. Do we have the, I think it's going to come. Got it? There we go. Pass there. The praise. There we go. Let's say this. Read this together, shall we? Ready? Let's do that. Praise be to God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. Let's worship. Death could not hold you, the veil totally for you. You silence the bows of sin and grave. The heavens are roaring, the praise of your glory. For you are raised to life again. You have no rival, you have no equal. Now and forever, God, you reign. Yours is the kingdom. Yours is the glory. Yours is the name above all names. What a powerful name it is. What a powerful name it is. What a powerful name it is. Nothing can stand against. What a powerful name it is. The name of Jesus. What a powerful name it is. The name of Jesus. What a powerful name it is. The name of Jesus. What a beautiful name it is. What a beautiful name it is. The name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a beautiful name it is. Nothing compares to this. What a beautiful name it is. The name of Jesus. I want to give blessings to each and every one of you for this Easter Sunday. And also those of you in the tent, our online family. And uh, we're about to have an a egg hunt. And it, I, it's just for the kids. <laughs> Sorry about that one. You know, next year we need to have an adult one and a kid one. It's like, because some of us, that, that child in us, is, we still want to play too, don't we? And also, 
there's some uh, people in the tent already know this one. There's some goodies in the back that are that, are, that might still be there. So I encourage you to to hang out with each other. And uh, God bless. Thanks for spending Easter with us here at the Cambria Vineyard today. God bless you and have a great day.